Good evening. Welcome. I'm James Clutton, Director of Opera and Chief Executive at Opera Holland Park. Welcome to our Young Artists Launch 2022. We're all here in this uh, square or this rectangle for you all to see. We're all as close as this, but socially distanced over many, many miles. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, for those of you who know about the Young Artists and those of you who don't, it's a very, very important and special project for us here at RHP. Um, our first Young Artist year was 2012. So even though it's the 10th, 10 years since that, this is the 10th version because we had to miss a year in 2020. When we first started this scheme uh, with our late great philanthropist back at uh, Christine Collins, one of the things that she asked me to come up with was an idea that she could support and you know get behind us on. And I said, what do you want? Just give me a word. And she said, opportunity. So that's where the young artists came from. It was just opportunity was the word that started the whole thing off. And to this day, I'm in auditions and I still think about who's going to take the opportunity as much as just who's the best artist or whatever. It's just about opportunity and taking it, putting people in the right position. We really believe in nurturing artists across the entire spectrum of jobs at RHP. Um, it's not a lip service thing. We've got 17, I think, I need to check, 17 young artists alumni in our main season this year. That's in roles on uh, repetitors, directors, conductors and singers across it. We believe in actually making it work and improving people's ability to be in pressure situations and work in different ways in different companies across the world. These artists range from Cecilia Stinton, who is a young artist alumni, is directing our production of Carmen this year on our main stage. It ranges range from Lada Valashova, who is our young artist conductor last year, conducting Onyegin the full cast, and all the way through everything. Um, something we're very proud of. And also, even when we're not using young artists, we believe in nurturing our two artists that lead in the uh, the cast in Carmen um, are both um, graduates of our chorus many years ago, admittedly, but they were both in our chorus and now they're in leading roles in Carmen and Don Jose. So that runs through the DNA of the company, the nurturing, putting on good work, quality work and looking after people. Um, and always trying to, in this particular situation, to get to thrive. I've gone past the thing I've wanted to survive anymore as a company. We do need to do that, but we need to thrive. And on that basis today, we announced a, a new commission. Uh, we've just commissioned Jonathan Dove, the great Jonathan Dove, to write a, an opera for us for the 23 season uh, called Itch, based on the novels by Simon Mayo. So we're really excited about that. All this news is on our website, so go and look at it there if you get a moment. These group of people here, I'm going to leave you in the great care of Anna Picard, who's going to introduce you to them all and take you through everyone's uh, stories of how they got here. We were just saying before we came on air that um, it's one of my favourite days. These people that we're just saying hello to some, we're saying hello again to some. Suddenly it's, we're just meeting properly like this for the first time as a group. And in you know six months time, but it will be in such intense relationships to get this show on and go through everything that happens on that. So it's a really exciting time. With young artists, we put them, for, you know, this will come up through the evening, I'm sure. They have proper rehearsal uh, schedule. They have rehearsal room themselves, stage management themselves. They have stage time, time with the orchestra. And most importantly, the pressure that performing a role comes on. It's not at college. It's not yet at our main stage. Well, it is on our, it's on our main stage, but it's not as part of that company. To keep people improving and, and in a supportive environment, being able to do their best work. So here we are. Thank you for joining us tonight, for listening to us and watching us. Thank you for supporting Opera Holland Park, which I'm sure that you do because you're here. And if you don't, welcome. This is your chance to support us from tonight. Have a lovely evening in the great company of this amazing set of artists. And I'll leave you now, pass you over to Anna. Anna. Good evening. Um, I'm Anna Picard. I'm Head of Communications and Insight at Opera Holland Park. This is the insight bit. Two years ago, we were in a rather um, dark uh, downstairs bar in Kensington, where we were lucky enough to certainly hear Rory sing, Rory Musgrave, Aaron Yegin. Um, now we're online, but the main thing is that we're getting this show back on the road. Um, some of our young artists here um, have waited, uh, will have waited two years to actually take on the roles that they were allotted back then. Some have left, we've got some new ones here, and I'm gonna start just by asking 
everybody to introduce themselves. Rory and, and, and the, um, the role that you're taking. Rory, please take it away. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rory Musgrave. I'm from the west coast of Ireland and I'm singing the role of Eugene Onyegin. Hannah. I'm Hannah von Wiele and I was born to American parents but raised in Russia and I will be conducting. Philip. Hi, my name is Philip Kostovsky. Uh, I was originally born in Australia and I'm currently based in London and I'll be singing the role of TK. Anne. Sorry, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Cooper and I'm uh, originally from Cumbria, living in London now, and um, I'm playing Olga. Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Minari. I'm from Philadelphia in the States uh, and I'm singing the role of Philippe Pivna. Henry. Hi, my name is Henry Grant Kurzweil. Um, I'm beaming to you from sunny Peckham in South London and I am lucky enough to be singing the role of Gremin for you this year. Alina. Hello, my name is Alina Sarokina. I'm from Moscow and I'm repetitor at the young artist uh, Evgeny Anegin, and I'm going to second Hannes' will, artistic will. Um, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Black. I'm originally from Nottingham, now living in London, and I'm this year's young artist director. And Lucy. Hello, my name is Lucy Anderson. I'm from Edinburgh and I'm singing Tatiana. So we have almost the full cohort. Um, unfortunately, Emily is probably off somewhere um, getting into role, perhaps arranging a marriage for someone. Uh, we don't have Jack Roberts with us, who's singing the role of Lensky. Um, perhaps he's off writing poetry. Um, but we do have a nice video of Jack singing Lensky's aria, Kuda Kuda. Oh, uh -huh. 
Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. That was Jack Roberts singing Kuda Kuda, accompanied by Florent Mugier. I'd like to start this evening by talking to Alina Sorokina, who is our repetitor. Alina, what is it like working with artists, trying to coach them through certain arias? Well, as a, uh, as a coach, it's... Um... It's always like interesting every aria, yeah, in in your story and uh, every singer a singer like is like a prison for this aria. So it's always the, never the same as being at the coach. But uh, on this, uh, in the, at the young artist, I am a repetiteur. So my my mission here will be to represent the orchestra and to yeah follow the will and gesture of Hanna and just give. Uh, uh, for all the singers that like, uh, imagine what it will be, how it will be then at the already at the Zitz probe to sing with the real orchestra. But and uh, Hannah, um, how close is the relationship between the repetitor and the conductor? It's like a marriage in its happiest and its most unhappy moments, I think. Being a newlywed, I think I have a new perspective on that, in that. It, you have to have that kind of closeness. You have to completely trust each other because Alina will catch things I won't and I will catch things she won't when she's flying across the keyboard. So it's about clear communication between us and also a united front and making sure that we present cohesive information to the singers because they have enough to think about. So the last thing we want to do is I say five things and Alina says five different things and then they've got a muddle of stimuli. So it's absolutely crucial. Yeah. Um, Lucy, uh, we, but you've um, worked a lot with um, Lada Valesheva, haven't you? Who's conducting the sort of the, 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 the main cast. Um, uh, what is it like uh, unpicking a really long 
really complex aria, such as you know, Tatiana's letter scene. I mean, you're in a bedroom now. It's not your bedroom. It's Nikki Spencer's bedroom. We know this. <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're sort of in the right place. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you pace yourself through that really, really long scene? I think with, with in terms of the letter scene in particular, it's about uh, finding a narrative that makes sense to me. Um, because obviously Russian is very far away from my mother tongue and it's about imagining myself in a situation that makes sense to me for example I am now in my friend's bedroom uh, how could I find myself in a situation where I am feeling the same emotions that she is feeling but in a sort of modern day setting or in a sense that relates to my own personal life or even a piece of art that I've seen that is more relatable to to modern day so I think certainly finding what makes sense to me personally and also just breaking everything up into into pieces so that we start at one point and we get to another point and everything that comes in the middle. And uh, your character Tatiana is the person that makes the most obvious journey through the opera you know she, she she starts as a naive girl and ends as a, a, a princess um that's an enormous uh, a, a transformation to take on and to express it, are you starting to think about it in terms of body language or or or, or presence or yeah so I think I think it's the same thing really it's imagining how how that journey could happen to me in my own life and then putting it into 19th century Russia. Um, I think the acting is something that I like to think about before the rehearsal process begins, but a lot of it comes with the direction and how you relate to the other characters on stage. So definitely starting to think about little things, but I think a lot comes in the room as well. So Emma, as, as the young artist director, do you like your artists to come in with lots of ideas um, or do you prefer them to be, you know, a blank page? Um, I, I always prefer ideas over, over a blank page. I think directing, it's so much better when it's a dialogue between yourself and the singer as opposed to a you're going to stand here, you're going to move here, because that's like, but why? And it's all, and I'm always so aware everyone has prepared their part so well, and they know it so well that to then, to use that knowledge is only a, only a good thing. So yes, no, I like, I like ideas, definitely. Um, Jane, um, you've, 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 you've trained uh, internationally, uh, like Alina and, uh, and like Hannah. Um, I last saw you as a sort of disembodied head attached to a cartoon um, teacup. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about that project, which I believe was directed by another former um, OHP young artist? Uh, well, yes, uh, it was um, uh, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges uh, by Ravel. Uh, and it was um, done by the Virtual Opera Project. Uh, and basically they took uh, everybody, recorded their own bits individually, kind of um, where they were living in their bedrooms and their kitchens. Uh, and they were all kind of stitched together uh, and directed um, and conducted in a really kind of amazing way um, uh, by the team. And it kind of produced this really cool project that we could create uh, this entire um, kind of fully formed opera, but have everybody be in all over the world, uh, essentially. And it was a really interesting, cool thing to be a part of. And you got a new translation, didn't you? Yes. Uh, yeah, it was really, really interesting. And, and I really, really appreciate it uh, as, um, uh, you know, being Asian American uh, oftentimes uh, because you know, opera as an art form is, you know, several hundred years old. Uh, it's kind of um, steeped in a little bit of colonialism, um, you know, just because of the history of how the world has gone so far. Uh, and uh, I was really, really heartened by their choice to uh, have a singing translation in Mandarin. Um, Cause I think that's kind of an important move towards, uh, you know, kind of breaking away from a little bit of that, um, not so great history, uh, especially because the original text is kind of um, what I like to call white nonsense uh, and wasn't really any language at all. So uh, I really, really appreciated that. And I really uh, like that um, you know, opera is moving more in that direction. 
Um, so uh, white nonsense. It's a, it's a sort of you know fake well Chinese. I suppose it's supposed to sound like um, lovely little um, jazz, sexy little jazz duet um, in in which I think the cup actually probably comes on top really because um, uh, the, uh, the the boxing the boxing um, other partner uh, just comes across as a complete fool. But it's quite interesting to have a, a different language. Um, uh, plonked down in the middle of an opera that's in one language. And Philip, um, your part uh, in, in Inyegi, Monsieur Triquet, you mostly sing French. Is it proper French? Is it, is it, is it made up French? Um, there's a little bit of a mixing between kind of Russian and French, but uh, it is primarily in French. And it was interesting coming to my first Russian role thinking, oh, okay, great. I get to learn this language I've never delved into before. And then I go, oh, Hang on a second, it's all French, <laughs> something a bit more familiar. But uh, there are parts of Russian in there, which, you know, of course, will be great to dip my toes into for the first time. And it's, it's Russian with a French accent, isn't it? Yes, yeah, which is interesting to kind of have a French accent and then think, how would a French person speak Russian? So it's kind of like, you know, in and of itself, uh, kind of a self-referential thing, which will be interesting to explore. Right, Alina, I hope you're up for this one. Oh. Um, uh, I, I was going to call you Olga. I'm so sorry, Anna. Um, you also bring a specific uh, skill set to Olga, who loves dancing and pleasure. You are actually a dancer. Um, well, I have danced, yeah, in my past life. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose I did it. I did dance like from a young age, and when I was. Um, did it for A level, which was amazing, like contemporary dance. Um, and then, yes, I started doing a bit of like musical theatre and I was often like a solo dancer. Um, so yeah, it, weirdly, when people find out I can dance, they add it into things. <laughs> so I did um, Orlovsky and they made me like a Beyonce and I had to do like high kicks in the aria, which was great fun. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for lots of that in as Olga, because I know she likes to dance. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Rory, you're, you're currently working on um, one of our exports, I believe. Um, Will Todd's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Tell us all about that. Yes, uh, I'm currently in Dublin singing White Rabbit uh, in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland uh, with Opera Collective Ireland. Um, uh, it's a marvellous, marvellous, fun piece, uh, complicated, sophisticated, funny, and uh, it, it really just appeals to adults and children. It's a fantastic, very fine line that Will Todd has, uh, has trod, as it were, not to rhyme, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he, it's a, it's a marvellous, marvellous piece. We've literally just sung it through for the first time today, uh, today, uh, so uh, uh, we're really only just beginning to get stuck into it now. Uh, we start staging uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, dressing up in big white bunny rabbit ears and hopping around the stage like a lunatic, uh, uh, which was going slightly from the ridiculous and then moving to the sublime uh, with Onyegin, which would be rather fun. Yeah, please don't have the <laughs> rabbit ears on when you do any again. Um, Henry, you're a veteran of Alice, aren't you? You've done it. Yeah, and I hope Rory realises that the, the real role of the show is base Victorian. <laughs> so as our, as our ex-Victorian, you, you, you've now had a sort of jump up through the social classes and you're a prince. How does yeah. that feel? He's doing well. He's doing well. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, it's, uh, Gremin, well, like with many of these roles in this show, you know, these are iconic roles. They really are. Gremin is one of the most iconic bass roles there is to sing. It's one of the roles of the repertoire. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's really exciting to have the opportunity to to get to know him and exciting to have the spotlight having been you know a, a supporting actor I mean you were you were fantastic as Dr Grenville in Traviata which um you know Emma was assisting on on, on Traviata last summer the revival uh, and that that was um 
I thought especially moving because of the redesign of the theatre, when you, you have that final quintet, I, I don't think I'd ever really heard of it, heard it as a quintet before, because your eyes are always on Violetta and, and, and Alfredo, but, but, but to have you and Anina and Germain there, placed like that, in that light, so very, very close to the audience, that, that, that was quite something, wasn't it? Emma, um, how did you find working in that space with the wraparound, the orchestra? I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was so cleverly done. And also what Regina Geisner, who directed Traviata, decided to do with it, was that she kind of saved that, down, that downstage section for, for Act Three. And m one of my favorite days in any process is always the studio run, because you're so close to the action. And then I always feel sometimes then when you get into a theater, there is then that remove, and it's still wonderful, but it's not, not quite that, up close and personal and what I felt Traviata gave the audience especially in Act 3 was that experience of a studio run because we were so close to the action and she was literally she was right there everyone obviously everyone was right there but it just it, you kind of wanted to reach out and touch her and go no we're here we're here everyone loves you and it was just so every night because I watched every performance um every night cried cried like baby every night me too um Hannah, you're, you're used to conducting in unusual venues, aren't you? Would you like to tell us a little bit about your orchestra? Yes, so I founded Oxford Alternative Orchestra that has partly the mission set of bringing traditional repertoire to non-traditional venues and uh, non-traditional repertoire to traditional venues. So we do it back and forth but we have played everywhere from shopping malls to prisons, refugee detention centers, warehouses, bookshops, public streets. The idea of being that we, we can be more adventurous about where we bring this music and also who gets to hear it based on where we are. That's fantastic. Um, and Philip, of course, you, you've had experience of this stage, haven't you? Because you were in Vixen last year. Yes, yeah, getting used to the uh, open air stage. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great environment. Fantastic. I think we should just cut to a little bit more music now. This is, this is Lucy, pre-recorded. She's not doing it live. Um, um, pre-recorded singing um, Marinka's aria. Is it not from um, The Bartered Bride? Uh, Ten Lasky Sen. Yeah. 
And that was Lucy Anderson, our Tatiana, um, singing there in Czech, uh, Smetana's uh, uh, The Bartered Bride, Ten Lusky, then accompanied by Florent Mouguier. Um, Lucy, that's an extraordinary, uh, uh, extraordinarily beautiful aria. How different is it singing in Czech to singing in Russian? Uh, well, the Czech alphabet, firstly, is the, the same as the, the alphabet that we have. It's not Cyrillic, so it is a little bit easier to sing, uh, well, to, to read when you're not a native speaker, even though there are some sounds that are different. Um, but in terms of the actual physical sounds, there are a lot of uh, similarities there. Um, but the music so often is based in um, the folk tradition of the country. And I think there's a crossover there between the Czech Republic, as we now know it, and Russia. So. It's certainly Slavic repertoire is some of my favorite. Uh, when did you develop that uh, interest? When, when did you feel that that's where your voice was heading into the Slavic repertoire? Completely by chance, really, when I was at Guildhall a few years ago and I was just asked to sing um, a section of the letter scene and do some Russian songs in a concert um, and was coached by Lada. Um, and I worked a lot with Lada when I was at Guildhall as well and I just love the music and when you just feel like something fits vocally because singing is very hard even though we're supposed to make it look easy when something feels like it, it's a natural thing for the voice to do it you have to stick with that. Anna is, is, is Slavic repertoire a particular thing for you or do you have a, um, a yearning to be singing in Spanish or French or Italian? Sorry, was that for me? Yes, it was. Sorry. Um, I I mean, I haven't done much repertoire in Czech or Russian, actually, but I absolutely, I'm, I'm really excited to delve into it. I think probably my favourite language is, is French so far, but who knows, that could change. <laughs> uh, would that be the same for you, Jane? Uh, well, I haven't done very much Czech, but I love singing in Russian. Um, 
uh, I love uh, yeah, particularly Russian song. Uh, love um, kind of like Mussorgsky. Um, one of my favorite cycles to sing is uh, Ditskaya. Um, but uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Philip, um, ha having sung the um, Janáček, um, uh, do do you feel that you're you're heading in a Slavic tenor direction? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I am uh, Slavic. I, 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 my parents are both uh, Macedonian, so there's kind of that Balkan Slavic kind of influence there. Um, I have I have sung a few pieces in Russian, um, and it seems to kind of fit uh, in the same sense that you know when I talk to my grandparents, I'll speak Macedonian. There's there's quite a lot of uh, similarity and crossover. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be very excited to uh, discover that I am a Slavic tenor and that's kind of where my fach is. Uh, and uh, I guess, who knows, well, I'll have to explore that. What about you, Henry? Yeah, this is actually my first time singing Russian solo. I've done lots in the chorus in Russian and it's, you have a lot of words to learn. And as everyone's touched on, the alphabet is different. And so when you're in the chorus trying to learn huge quantities of Russian you're just literally you're learning off the transliteration so you find us all backstage chanting in our dressing rooms the scene the next scene coming up just desperately trying to get all the words in so it is a real challenge um but I'm finding you know Gremin obviously because he wrote it for young voices and it's it's beautifully written the, the the way the vowels sit on the phrases is really really wonderful to sing and I'm just adoring discovering this new you know it's, it's a whole different style of not singing but of interpretation of words and I'm just adoring the journey on it. Uh, Rory would you agree with that? Absolutely I love singing in Russian not that I've done much of it um, uh, since leaving college. Uh, I, I don't know what it says about me, but when I was having to put recitals together for exams and so on and so forth, I was gravitating to Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky songs, something to do with the, um, the forlorn romanticism of it uh, that somewhat drew me and uh, drew me in. And a bit like Lucy, actually, I found that it sat well in the body and i think that's i think that's where the body and the sensibility of one's personality meet and uh and russian though linguistically you know coaches might say well the the, the vowels are very italian it and so on and so forth that's true on a technical level but there's a sensibility that's totally different it isn't italian it's not french it's russian it's very it is romantic and intense and um i think there are touch point touchstone points that bring it in contact with the other languages that we're more used to singing, but it is its own beast and you have to uh, just almost give way to it and uh, commit yourself to it. And it's, it's challenging, but it's really satisfying when you get it in the body. So I'm loving this. Uh, it's a lovely thing to come back to uh, from after a long pause from singing Russian. And at the risk of infuriating anybody who is Italian, uh, uh, who's, who's watching, I, I have to say, it seems to me, as a, but that I don't speak Russian, it seems to me uh, to be a language which encourages legato. Is that fair, Alina, Hannah? Absolutely, if I, if I may say. Uh, actually, I found Russian since I, I was studying at the Guildhall at uh, two years at the opera course, and I was lucky to um be trained by like the best language coaches italian french german coaches at the guild hall who work in the best like opera was best opera companies and we we're absorbing this experience uh, of different languages and applying to it to russian i just uh, rory put it so well it's actually can be such a healthy such a uh, comfortable uh language to sing and producing this legato as soon as you have the uh, if you tune and, and your uh, inner hearing and your system, if you tune to Russian, it can be really healthy, really comfortable to sing. And I really, really hope that maybe I have a couple of tips to bring for the table for the, our young artists to help. <laughs> to make it Fantastic. Um, uh, 
Hannah, um, can we just start dispelling some myths about uh, about I don't know Russian sound, Russian music? Um, I, I think one of the words that is often used is is sort of heavy, but Anyakin is not a heavy uh, opera, is it? Could you talk a little bit about the the orchestration, about the style of writing? I think heavy is often confused with rich because while it's not heavy, it's extraordinarily rich, both in harmonic development, in the color of the orchestration, uh, and also in the vocal characteristics. So I'm sure Lucy would tell you, it's on the one hand not heavy, but it's very far from being light. There's a huge demand that's made on the voice and the, the range of many of the parts, Onegin being one of them, Tatjana of course being another, the range is, is quite extreme. So I think one of the myths actually is that because it's written for young people, it's easier. Mm. I actually think he wrote it for young people that he wanted to challenge and cause their voices to expand and grow and deepen and prepare them for some of the most, the allegedly most challenging Russian repertoire. Emma, you have a very interesting task ahead of you in that uh, you're going to be working within a framework that, um, that, that, that Julia Borbach has set up in terms of the uh, where the chorus move, the general kind of blocking. What do you do as, uh, as the young artist director in terms of the more intimate scenes? How much can you make them your own and those of your colleagues here tonight? I think, well, for starters, they, they won't be mine, they will be my esteemed colleagues, because they'll be the ones performing them. Um, I think what I love about this opera is that it's all about the emotional intelligence or lack of between all these characters. And it's, and although there is a plot, obviously, but it's really more about the feelings and kind of who, who who's influenced by who and, and, and decisions that people make, as opposed to some kind of brand, some outside force, uh, you know, manipulating the plot. It's actually, it's about these people. It's a very, I like to call it, it is not for grown-ups. It's about, it's about emotions. Um, so therefore I think working with everyone, uh, we really kind of delve into everyone's emotional state. Lucy put it brilliantly kind of starting at one point and how you get to, if you start at point A, but how do you end up at point B and the emotional journey that you yourself take to get there and how it will make sense for you. So I think there's gonna be a lot of talking, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, and I just really looking forward to kind of like really delving into these really complex characters. And uh, Jane, um, Philip Yevna is really, really important to how we understand this society in the setup. Uh, she's, you know, the family retainer. She's, she's known Olga and Tatiana's mother since she was a girl. She's witnessed it all. She has this extraordinary backstory of, of, of having been married at what, age 13? or something like that. Um, God sends us habit from above to compensate for love, I think is the old, the old translation. Can you, can you tell, you're a very young, very beautiful woman. How are you going to approach playing um, an elderly um, sort of babushka? Oh, well, I mean, like how anyone would approach anything with uh, great care and uh, thoroughness and meticulous attention to detail. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I do uh, is very, I like to, a lot of the times with a, working with a character that isn't um, uh, per se like my age or as much younger than I am or much older than I am, I like to sometimes work uh, from the outside in and kind of um, think about what kind of uh, physical decisions I'm making uh, with my character uh, in terms of uh, tempo, uh, how fast I'm moving uh, or um, kind of how uh, I'm using my body um, on stage and in relation to other characters, um, but also giving attention to the text and relationship to uh, uh, whoever I'm speaking to on stage at the moment as well. Okay, um, and, and Philip, I, I mean, again, one of these uh, sort of, a part that sort of almost isn't there, but actually is very, very important because you set up this, uh, you're the star turn in this in this name day party at, at which uh, 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 Tatiana's humiliation is 
extreme um, at which we have the fallout between um, uh, Lensky and Inyegin, uh, uh, and you have this exquisite old fashioned sort of French aria. I, I, I mean, who do you think Monsieur Chiquet is? Yeah, I, I, I mean, he, he's a tutor to Tatiana, and I think um, he's, he's, he's an older man and he's probably a little batty, but he, he remembers, uh, you know, his days of his youth. Uh, and uh, perhaps with Tatiana wishes that he were a bit younger, uh, uh, born a bit later, perhaps. Um, but no, I, I think, you know, just even the way he enters with the, with the kind of the, the group of uh, young ladies, I think he's just someone who is very French, very much enjoys life. And uh, yeah, it comes at that point of the second act just as tensions are rising and just kind of acts as a bit of a pressure valve uh, for that kind of situation. Excellent. Um, uh, Anna, Olga, um, she's just, she disappears at the end of that party, we don't see her again. We know that Pushkin uh, says that she, she, she marries an officer in the army. Um, is she just a flirt? Is there, is there more to her? I, yeah, I think there is more to her. Um, she is, I think she's naive and um, she's, you know, young and makes mistakes maybe in terms of, yeah, how she holds herself and, and she did, but I, I, I think she is the innocent one in it. I think um, it's um, she just loves life and having fun and a party and dancing and probably didn't realise the consequences of that. And, um, and a, you know, the way that um, the man kind of is doing the flirting, it, it is blamed on the woman, which happens in in all life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that she she's just naive and um, she she obviously really deeply cares about Tatiana and wouldn't, wouldn't want to hurt her in that way. And I think she's she is devastated, devastated by the duel. Um, but yeah, we don't see that, obviously, <laughs> but I think it's all there. OK, so Rory, come on, admit it. Are you just a cad? <laughs> Um, uh, from a certain point of view. Uh, I think uh, the difficulty playing the character of Anjegan is that he can very easily fall into um, uh, certainly an anti-hero at least. Um, I, I think what Emma was saying earlier is that these people are human beings and, uh, and what's going on in their heads Obviously, it's stretched out with this beautifully romantic music, but actually it's intensely naturalistic in a funny way. It's highly poetic, but it is naturalistic. And it's as though the old forces of drama that would have been established in the Greek tradition, external forces have suddenly become completely internalized. So Onegin is a victim of his own... Uh, his own hubris, his own uh, set of circumstances. In some ways, he's a, a tragic figure. I'm not saying he's a thoroughly good person. What I'm saying is, is that he can't help himself. He hears gossip. In the start of Act Two, he's hearing all this gossip about rumors about who he is. He's a Freemason. He's an alcoholic. And he gets annoyed at Lensky. He's, his ego, his pride is hurt. And he just means to snub his nose at Lensky. So he starts dancing with Olga. It's a very human thing, mm. actually. Uh, it's petty, but it's human. And it's that pride, that peacockish pride and that fragile ego that actually is the, is the moment where the first domino is flicked and it starts the chain reaction that leads to the tragic end in act two. And then by the time you get to act three, you have this realization that he hasn't really been the master of his own fate and that he has had all the opportunities to make different choices. And he, for whatever reason, being blind to his own nature or being blind to the, the training that society has, has forced upon him, 
he's left alone at the end. And, um, and so I, it's intensely human. It's intensely poetic. I don't think he's just a cat. Um, I, I, at least as the singer, as the actor, I have to like him on some level and certainly sympathize with him because otherwise I'd be playing him as a mustache twirling villain. And I don't think that's what we're here to do. Um, uh, as fun as that could be, <laughs> but I think that's a different show. Yeah, I think that would be Anyegi in the comic opera. Um, uh, I, I should say at this point that anybody who's watching who is not already a supporter of the Young Artists or is not a member of the Young Artists Circle can certainly choose to become one. Um, please contact Rosamond Hatfield, our very wonderful um, uh, manager of individual giving, um, or go to our website. If you go to the How to Support bit and then you pull down uh, Support Our Young Artists, artists you will find out exactly how to do that and if you do join up you will be able to attend uh, such wonderful treats as a masterclass with Amanda Rucroft who is making her role and company debut as Madame Lorena um, in Onyegin this summer um, and she's doing a masterclass with the young artists on March the 28th at Pushkin House. We've had a couple of very very interesting uh, uh, questions, um, one of which is quite classic, one of which is topical, I would say. Let's go with the classic one, first of all, uh, from Karina Crabb. Um, I love the idea that Tchaikovsky wrote it for young singers. It'll be a special performance for you all, which it will, and for us. Do you read the Russian classics? Quick round now, uh, Rory. Uh, I've read Eugene Onyegin, uh, and I have attempted a few others, but I'm not going to lie, I've struggled, <laughs> so. Hannah. Yes, and if you love Eugene Onyegin, a plug for a hero of our time, if you're watching, Giroi Nashova Vremenyi, another fantastic, gripping 19th century Russian novel. Super, Philip. Yes, I, I, I dabbled in a bit of Dostoevsky as a, as a teen, yep. Fantastic. Jane? Well, not since my teenage years, um, and mostly just a few of the classics. <laughs> Lucy? I'm reading Eugene Onyegin in English, obviously, and have read a bit of War and Peace, but again, for research for the opera, so I'm not sure if it counts. Emma, come on, you look like an Anna Karenina person. Um, so yes, I have read Anna Karenina, uh, but also when I was a teenager, I went through a Tegenev phase. I can't remember why, but for about three months there, that's all I read in English was Tegenev. I can't now remember anything about them. <laughs> Alina. Well, yes, I read, I read a lot of, um, did read a lot of Russian classics, but actually recently I read uh, Jerome K. Jerome, three in the book, and it was such a delight. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, yes. How to get to know this culture, goodness me, yes, 19th century humour. Um, uh, uh, Pete wanted to call you Olga, I'm so sorry, Anna. Fine, I, I will respond to Olga as well. <laughs> um, I have to admit, just, yeah, just Eugene O'Neill and I've read. Come on, Henry, you're definitely a Dostoevsky person. Does watching the films count? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, Darkoff, no? I mean, of okay. course, I've read them all, Land in the Original. What do you take me for? Okay, fantastic. Um, just exactly as we expected. Now, this is rather more serious. Um, this is from uh, Agnes Corey. And I'd really actually like to get anybody's opinion on this who's here. I, I know what our opinion is as a company, but anybody who wants to chip in, just raise your hand. And it's a good place to speak. Um, are you resolute that you will perform this opera? There were unpleasant scenes when Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony was performed at Exeter last week and the Warsaw Opera House cancelled Boris Goodenough. Um, Hannah, would you like to go first on this? I'm sure you have very strong feelings about this. Certainly. This is a story about love and infatuation and finding your way in the world. And I will say, Tchaikovsky had nothing to do with any of this. So if we need music at any time, we need it now. And what better way to engage with the culture, to engage with the good a culture has done than by doing exactly that, embrace the things that are good and beautiful, because there are many of those. Um, 
and it would be a travesty if beauty were also a casualty of war. Thank you, Hannah. Would anybody else like to add anything to that? Well, our position as a company is that uh, Anyagin in both versions, uh, Pushkin and Tchaikovsky is like Michelangelo, is like Shakespeare, and yes, we are very, very much going ahead. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, a, an, an Anyagin uh, focus event coming up on the 15th of March, and this Friday at uh, lunchtime, we'll be um, gathering together some of our singers, and we're all going to be performing um, the Ukraine national anthem um, outside the Ukrainian Institute. Um, they are our neighbours in Opera Holland Park, um, in Holland Park. Um, the last thing I should say before we wrap up um, is thank you to all of our wonderful young artists and young repetitor and young director and young conductor. We can't wait to actually see you on stage. Um, uh, I should also add that the young artists' performances, which are almost always completely sold out, are on uh, June the 13th and June the 23rd. That's uh, Eugene and Yegin. Um, again, um, if you go to operaholandpark.com forward slash support hyphen young hyphen artists, uh, you can find out how to support them. Oh, one final word, something I forgot to ask. We've talked a lot about uh, young versus emerging. Um, Henry, I am looking at you, uh, because we had this uh, same thing with uh, Lada Bella Shiva, who will be um, conducting the, um, the the main cast, the, the grown-up cast, the old cast in in, in Inyegin. Um, I know that in a lot of uh, literary prizes, a lot of artist prizes and schemes and so forth, they've jettisoned the word uh, young and replaced it with emerging. Um, Henry, I mean, you're actually a very experienced performer. Can you explain what is different about going into this scheme now? Yeah, very much. Um, so this will be my, this is actually my third Young Artist Programme. My first was in 2004 when I sang Dan Alfonso at Grange Park, age 23. Um, finished that, went, oh, what next? There was no support, there was no guidance. That's nothing to do with, you know, that's not to lay any blame on WASFI or anyone involved with that. It's just the way the business is. When you're young and you emerge from college and you're a hot commodity, people want you and you're put out into roles. And if you're really lucky, you get picked up and off you go. If you don't, um, you then go and find companies you like working with, spend a lot of time working on your craft, a lot of time working on your acting, a lot of time working on your voice and you just keep going and you wait for opportunities to arise and when they do arise you take them um i was actually this came about me being in this show by me being in the office with james and him going h what do you want to do and i was like well actually james you know what i've never sung an aria with a full orchestra on the main stage i've gone given over you know 1500 main stage performances but i've never sung an aria not once and you know what it's absolutely terrifying I'm terrified. <laughs> I've never done it. Well, we'll all be there cheering <laughs> you on. It's going to be great. Uh, but, and it's lovely. I, I, sorry, go on. But that's the key point about this, this, this um, scheme is this, what James said earlier. It's the opportunity and support that this company gives its young artists, not only once they're on it, but once they've finished. And the the fact that they know that they're able to go to James or any member of the team and ask for guidance, um, you know, advice on their career and what to do next. That's the important thing about this scheme. And that's what it gives people. It gives people real opportunity, not only to be seen, but to try things out, being supported and guided. That's, sorry, I just wanted to say that because that's the key thing about this one. That's brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Henry. Um, we're going to wrap it up now and uh, probably close with a trailer of the season. I can't wait to see you all on stage. Many, many thanks to Rory, to Hannah, to Philip, to Jane, to Lucy, to Emma, to Alina, to Anna and to Henry. Um, good night. <laughs>